Um, the speakers and panels are being recorded by Smile God Loves You Media. If you would like a box CD set, flash drive, or digital download of the meetings, please pre-order these by Saturday to, to get after the last speaker on Sunday. Um, so pre-order by Saturday, please. Um, and we do encourage you to support the speakers. Um, they are carrying a message and providing a service in Alcoholics Anonymous that is getting very challenging for the tapers that I know across the country uh, because of all the free content available. And yet, these are the people who are doing the tireless work to actually get these things recorded. So please support them. Um, I appreciate that. Um, individual CDs are ready shortly after each meeting and may be purchased at any time. All right. Welcome to the Third Step Workshop. Um, as a reminder, this is a family-centered conference. We do ask that you refrain from using profanity while sharing. I mean, you know, do your best. Mm. Uh, also, the first two rows have been reserved for those with mobility restrictions um, and the timer. Uh, please be respectful and do not sit in or save seats in the first two rows. Um, and uh, that's that. Okay, I'm going to read the third step just so that we know where we're at here. It's kind of early for some of us up on the mountain. <laughs> Okay, step three, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. And I'm super excited uh, to start us off. I have my very good friend. I met her in 1998, and she is in Al-Anon, and her name is Juanita. My good friend Juanita. Hi, everyone. My name's Juanita, and I'm a very grateful member of the Worldwide Fellowship of el -Anon. I was really hoping just to sit back and uh, just take it easy for a little bit longer, so, but that's not the case. So, um, Made a decision to turn our will and our lives over the care of God as we understood him. So my marching orders is that I'm supposed to um, take from the ABCs and onto page 61. And... Um, it says that the whole point of this is to grow along spiritual lines. I just want it to feel better, right? I mean, didn't, didn't you guys, didn't you just want to feel better? Didn't you just want life to like go well? And I just wanted to be able to manage better, you know, like manage my life better so that everything was okay. And it tells me that that's not the point. The point is to grow along spiritual lines, that there's principles that have been set down and there are guides to progress, and we claim spiritual progress rather than spiritual perfection. Well, already I'm screwed because, um, you know, I'm bankrupt on all of that. So it says, this is how I read the ABCs. The description of the obsessive controlling family member, the chapter to the agnostic, and personal adventures before and after make clear three pertinent ideas. A, that I am an obsessive controlling family member and cannot manage my own life. B, that probably no human power could have relieved my alcoholism. For me, that also means my sponsor. C, that God could and would if he were sought. And if I'm convinced, I'm at step three, which is that I decide to turn my will and my life over the care of God as I understand him. And just what do we mean by that and what do I do? The first requirement is that I must be convinced that my life run on my self-will can hardly be a success. For me, what in my experience is that step three for me is a reiteration of the first step. Have you got it yet? Have you really got it? Have you got that you don't have the ability, the power on your own to manage your life? And when I'm in this place, I go, yeah, absolutely not. I prove it to myself over and over and over again. But I always go back to finding or, or there's areas where I keep trying to like just be willful, and boy, I'm just going to like barrel through, and I'm going to make things happen. And it's funny that I, that I was asked to do step three, because I do this group on Sunday mornings on Zoom, and we're doing step workshop. 
a step workshop on this, you know, and where we left off was exactly this place. And several years ago, my sponsor, many years ago, my sponsor had me read this. I'm going to read this because I think it's important. She says, I want you to read this based on what it is that you're going through right here, right now, what you're putting through the steps, right? And I thought, oh, seriously? It's like, that just sounds stupid. It sounds redundant. And I'll, I'll be honest with you, I didn't do it for a long time. Self-will, right? I'm going to like willfully just do it my way. Like that's worked, you know, but I'm going to keep doing it. And so, okay, so I'm reading it, and I'm going to try and read this in a way that, um, from stuff that I've put through before. So the first requirement is that I must be convinced that my life run on my self-will can hardly be a success. Well, it doesn't sound very good already, because on this basis, I am almost always in collusion with something or somebody. My husband. Always. My kids. I'm almost always in collision with my husband or my kids, even though my motives are good. And I've always got great motives, always. I am like most people, and I try to live by self-propulsion. And I lie to myself. I suffer from the delusion that that's not true. I'm really just trying to be helpful. I'm just trying to like, oh my gosh, I, you said this was a problem? Let me help you from the goodness of my heart and because I care and I love, I love you so much, I'm just going to help you and I offer advice. We have this phrase where we say, giving somebody advice when it's not asked for is criticism. And I didn't, I mean, I've heard it for forever, but that applies to you guys because you don't know really what I know. I've got a lot of knowledge, I've got a lot of experience, so, and, and clearly, especially with my kids and my husband, it's like, they just don't have enough information, right? I mean, they just don't know enough about certain things, so I've got to help them. So, my motives are good, I'm just trying to be helpful. And I don't realize that I'm living by self-propulsion. So, I am the actor who wants to run the whole family show. I want to run the husband's show, I want to run the kid's show, I want to run the grandkid's show, and I am forever trying to arrange each one of them and their lives and my time, what I have to offer them in my own way, because I know things. If only my arrangements for them would stay put. If only Tom, the grandkids, my kids would do as I wished, the family show would be great. Everybody in the family, including myself, especially myself, would be pleased. Life would be wonderful. In trying to make all these arrangements, I may sometimes be quite virtuous, and I can be extremely virtuous, believe me. <laughs> I can be kind, considerate, patient. Oh, the patience. The, I mean, it's over and above, believe me. The generosity, unbelievable. And I am so modest. And I'm extremely self-sacrificing, believe me. I am like the ultimate martyr, right? I will give up my life for you just to make you okay. Now, here's the problem. There's only one reason I'm willing to do that. You know what it is? I want to be okay. I want to feel okay. It's really not about you. It's really all about me. That's the ultimate in selfishness. So on the other hand, I may be mean. <laughs> I'm not mean, I'm honest. <laughs> There is not a mean bone in my body. I am honest, you know? You just don't see it my way, so you call it mean. Right, Tom? I mean, I mean seriously. I'm egotistical. I'm selfish. I admit that. I'm egotistical. I'm selfish. I'm not mean. And, and dishonest. Oops. Well, there you go. There goes mean, right? As with most humans, I am more likely to have varied traits. And what happens? The family show doesn't come off very well. I begin to think 
that they don't treat me right. I forget it's never them. It's never them. It's always me. But when I'm full of self-centeredness and selfishness and willfulness, and I'm running on self-propulsion, I always think it's you, never me. So what happens? I decide to exert myself more. I become on the next occasion still more demanding or gracious as the case may be. Still, the family play, all these people in the family show, they don't do what I want. And the play doesn't suit me. Now, I admit, I may be somewhat at fault. Somewhat. I am sure that the, everybody else in the family is more to blame. And I become angry, indignant, and self-pity. And what is not my basic trouble? Am I not really a self-seeker even when trying to be kind? Am I not a victim of the delusion that I can wrest satisfaction and happiness out of this world if I only manage well? And that always ties back to the first step for me. Am I getting it? Because I tell you, when I finally began to read it the way my sponsor wanted me to read it, I was like, oh my God. I'm trying to manage one more time. Do I get it now? Now they get it. Family gets it. I think they don't get it. Because I'm subtle about it. But I'm not as subtle as I think I am. You see, they know me. They know I'm full of BS. So they, they get that what I'm trying to do is make them do what I want them to do. And what happens? They retaliate. And even if they don't retaliate, they wish to retaliate. And I know this is true because from my experience, when somebody tells me or offers a suggestion, the first thing I do is put the wall up and I go, that ain't going to happen. Never in a million years. Especially if it comes from Tom. It will not happen. I will not do it. Ever. <laughs> and I'm trying to snatch all I can. And each family member tries to snatch all they can from the family show. And am I not, even in my best moments, a producer of confusion rather than harmony? So I was asked a long time ago, actually I wasn't asked, I heard Clint Hodges, he's passed away, it's been a long time that he's passed away, but Clint Hodges used to say in the third step, what is it that I'm not willing to, what five things am I not willing to give up for a better relationship with God? And when I first heard that, it struck a note deep within me, and I, it, and I thought, oh, there's nothing I'm not willing to give up for a better relationship with God. Already I'm lying right? Because there's a lot of things I'm not ready or willing to give up for a better relationship with God. You know, but I don't want to say it out loud because I want to appear to you and lie to myself that I'm the perfect Al-Anon. There's nothing wrong with me. I'm just grown along spiritual lines and everything is fine and wonderful. And I, and I knew deep down within me that there were certain things I wasn't willing to give up, but I'm not even going to consider that. So, we don't go there. I don't go there. And then the next time it came up, comes up and I'm doing step work, I go, okay. And begrudgingly, I admit that there are certain things that I'm not willing to give up for a better relationship with God. I'm not willing to give up my money. I'm not willing to give up my house. I'm not willing to give up my husband. I'm not willing to give up my kids or my grandkids. I'm not willing to give up my security. Will I don't care. I'm not willing. And isn't it funny that every time I admit, I always, I, I always come back to the first step, which is about admitting. I admit, I admit, and I admit. And once I was able to admit it, I no longer had to hold on to that lie, and I could tell you the truth. And today, when I go through this place, I always find there are still areas I'm not willing to give up for a better relationship with God. But what are they? Because they've shifted. Some stay the same. And my job with this step is to put it all on the table. Because clearly, I don't do well. I don't do well. Last week, or two weeks ago, I had to speak at, on, online at a, a meeting. And I woke up that Saturday morning just feeling funky. There was nothing wrong. Nothing wrong 
at all. But I just woke up in a mood, you know, just woke up in a mood. And everything in me was like, God, I don't want to do this meeting. You know, it was going to be like at noon or something. And I thought, I don't want to do it. And I sat, I sat down, had my quiet time. But it was that kind of quiet time that I'm not really there. I'm doing it because I'm supposed to do it. Not because I have a desire to get closer to the power. I'm doing it because it's what I'm supposed to be doing. So I do it, I sit, and it's like nothing's changed. Why would it? Because the truth is I wasn't seeking, right? I wasn't seeking. I wasn't seeking a better relationship with God. You know, so some time goes on, and I'm not happy, you know, and it's getting closer to the meeting, so I take my shower, get ready, and, and I'm thinking, well, you better sit down one more time. And I sat down, and I said, God, here's the deal, man. You already know I'm in a funk, but I'm going to admit it. I'm in a funk. I don't want to do this meeting. I don't, I don't like these people. I don't like anybody right now, quite frankly. You know, I don't like me. I mean, even more than I don't like you, I don't like me because I don't like the way I feel. So here's the deal. If my attitude is going to change, you're going to have to change it because I really don't want it to change. I really don't care. I'm going to stick with this for the rest of today. And if you want it to be different, you make it different. And I took a breath. And I've got to tell you that it wasn't but seconds after that that something shifted within me. And I began to sit because I wanted God. There's something about that admission for me. Quit lying to myself. Quit deluding myself. Be honest. Now, God knew. That wasn't for God. That was for me. That was just for me. You know, I ask people, when you, when you want to start up a relationship with somebody, right, what do you do? You make time for them, right? When I first met Tom, long, long time ago, I found out that first day that I met him, that for, at where, where he liked to hang out. Now, you guys may be surprised, but it was actually bars. You know, so for the next several weeks, I'll, I'll, be, I'll wrap it up quick. So for the next several weeks, I'd go to these bars that he liked to hang out. And finally, after the third time, the third bar that I saw him at, he said to me, he says, you know, he says, I've known your family. I've known our friends. You have similar friends. And he said, I think that this must be fate. No, I was a stalker. I stalked him <laughs> because I wanted him. And isn't that what we do when we want someone, the other person the, of the opposite sex or same sex, whatever it is, we make time for him. But I wasn't making time for God. And my problem last Saturday was that I'd had about a week of not sitting down and really doing prayer and meditation. I wasn't seeking the power. I was lying to myself. Am I going to seek? Do I really want the power? Or am I lying to myself? Because God could and would if he were sought. And that's my job. Thanks. Thanks so much, Juanita. And next, we have my friend Kate from Ohio. I'm Kate, and I'm an alcoholic. Thank you so much, Juanita. Um, I, uh, well, I was crying in the hallway just before coming up here, if anybody notice that that's always a great state to be in before having a room full of people look at me under this super bright lighting early in the morning um but here i am erica's my sponsor so i did think about calling and saying like i really can't do this like you picked the wrong person but um it's not so much an option when it's your sponsor uh, my sobriety date is September 15th of 2008. Uh, my home group is Common Solutions in Cincinnati, Ohio. On Wednesday nights, we meet at 8 o'clock. It's a big book meeting. We have a break-off beginners meeting. Um, it's an excellent, excellent meeting. So if you're ever in town, holler. Um, I was having a... I have a brother who's been sober a long time. And life is, a, like, 
you know, tough right now, a little bit tough right now, just a lot. It's a lot, a lot, a lot. And, uh, and he's in a similar situation. He's moving his family to a new city and got promoted and all this stuff. And so we were talking about like, Oh my God, <laughs> just like, Ooh, I can't possibly get all this stuff done. And how it helps you like stay in the day and rely on God. And, and that's what he's saying. And luckily like we're on the phone, so he can't see me like rolling my eyes at this. And, uh, and my thought is like, well, you know what, Matt, it must be nice that your life isn't so full that you can rely on God. Like I'm way past that point, dude, like you don't get it. And that's really how I operate. You know, it's like the harder it gets, the more that I'm like, okay, I need to be running this here. Uh, I wrote this inventory. Those were not notes, by the way, I feel the need to explain that. That is my step work. Juanita was like, do you have notes? I'm like, no, I don't have notes. So, but I had written this inventory and, um, I don't remember what I was saying about that. <laughs> God help me. What was I saying? Oh, that's what I was saying. So I had written this inventory and, um, you know, I write the resentment and I'm writing the fear. And, and one of the things that came out of the fear, and I don't even remember which one it was at this point, like it matters, you know what I mean? It's like a hundred different faces. It's the same crap over and over and over again. So whatever fear it was that I've probably, you know, been writing on for almost 15 years now, um, I, uh, what was I saying? <laughs> I don't sleep when I come out here. So um, that's why I, I, if you see me looking real upset, that's probably a big part of why. Um, oh, so I'd written this inventory, and, w and one of the questions that I ask as I'm going through that, and I know I'm not talking about inventory, but just like it relates to self-reliance, is, um, you know, am I willing to be on a different basis? And, uh, you know, sometimes in inventory I have like varying levels of honesty, and I was just in a really uh, honest place. And so part of what I wrote was like, I am because I know that if God screws it up too bad, like I can literally just keep doing it my way. I can just take it back. And that's the truth. Like that is how I approach, you know, the spirit of the universe sometimes is like, look, well, all right, we'll give it a shot. But if you screw this up, like if I end up having to be more confident, competent here, then that's what I'll do, you know? And, uh, and I really mean that. But the flip side of that is like, yeah, I'm willing to give it a try because here's the thing. If I don't rely on God, if I don't allow God into areas of my life where I don't want God because it's actually going fine or I'm too afraid or, you know what I mean, I don't know what it would look like to have to have God in that area because I've always been able to rely on something else. Like, if I never try that, then I never know because I just know what I've always known. And um, this last year, I don't know that it's been a weird year. I don't know. Um, but some of the things that that I've really relied on have, um, and that I never would have been willing to give up to grow closer to God. Like, no, not at all interested. Like some of those things have just been removed. Um, and that's how it has to be for me because I'm so afraid, you know, because my natural state is not like, well, God, <laughs> why don't I give this to you? <laughs> you know, <laughs> oh, that, that's not what I do. And some of these things have to be ripped from me or they have to be burned out of me. And that can be a, a pretty painful process. Uh, I'm going to look at the book now, folks. Um, well, uh, it's talking here about me, different forms of me, right? I'm, I'm this actor, I'm self-centered, I'm egocentric, that being my real issue. And basically that like, hey, life is good, but it's not good enough for me, you know, and I'll complain and complain and complain when most people will look at my life from the outside and be like, dang, you know, she lives a pretty good life, right? Um, it says, whatever our protestations are, not most of us concerned with ourselves, our resentments and our self-pity. Uh, and I've had to take a pretty ugly look at that recently. I got engaged in February and um, so as we're kind of like walking through that process or whatever, we have uh, seen, been seeing a counselor. And so what I've had to really start to see is like, I'm right about a lot of things. And like, and that's not what I was, I'm sorry, that's not what I was supposed to see. I already knew that, that came out wrong. But it is true, I'm just saying. Like, <laughs> there's some things that I'm not very good at in life, like there's lots of things that I'm not good at, but what I am good at is like, I'm super confident and like I do things right and everything is organized and it's in place and it's put away and it's exactly how it should be. And I'm really good at that. And I know the right way and the best way. And so what, 
I've started to see, right, working with this, this counselor, um, and not this about counsel, I mean, it's the same stuff, right? It's like, do you want to pay somebody $170 an hour, or do you just want to read the book? Like, well, I guess I'll just pay this money, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I guess we'll just try this. But anyway, it's the same principles. And so what he has, has helped me to see is, like, the, the issue with, with communication and with, and with conflict with my partner and I is, like, it's not that I'm not right because I am, but that isn't what matters. It doesn't matter. You know what I mean? Like, I'm concerned with me, me, instead of like, oh, here's my partner, like, saying something to me that I might think, like, that's not true, that's not real, he's delusional, he's sick, I wish he would call Tom, right? <laughs> I might think all these things, Tom, I do think those things. I'm like, God. But um, that might all be correct, but I've missed the entire point because the point is like, here's my partner and my role is to have compassion and love and, and non-judgment towards my partner and I miss all of that. Um, so yeah, I'm concerned with me and myself and I'll be concerned with you uh, easily when it has to do with you doing what I want so that then I can be more okay and getting beyond that of like actually setting me aside and just seeing you um, man, I struggle, you know, and like, that's embarrassing, but I do, I do. I, I guess I'm not where I used to be. I came in this program and, um, I had a physical allergy an extremely mild mental obsession. Um, I really didn't have unmanageability. I did not have the selfishness that is honestly like the things that people were talking about in here. I did not have those problems. And so AA was going to fix my drinking, and then I would fix everything else on my own because, like I share with you, I'm very, very competent. I'm really good at, like, getting it done, you know? And so I've come a long way, I guess, from that <laughs> um, to be like, oh, yeah, I, I really belong here when these people are talking about this stuff. It sounds a lot like my thinking, but I still have a, a long way to go. Um, selfishness, self-centeredness, that we think is the root of our troubles. Driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, and self-pity. Self, self, I mean, my God, right? Uh, we step on the toes of our fellows and they retaliate. Sometimes they hurt us seemingly without provocation, but we invariably find that at some time in the past we have made decisions based on self, which later placed us in a position to be hurt. Um, I have brought some painful things into my life, uh, even in sobriety, some very painful things. And you could have looked at those situations from the outside and been like, man, you know, poor victim Kate, like she's really, she really got a bad deal on that one, right? And that would have been true. That would have been factual. But the other truth is like, I create those situations so that I can feel safe when I'm not willing or I'm not able to find my safety in God, when I'm not willing or not able to go deep down within me to find my safety, and I'm putting it in the hands of sick people. And I don't mean that like bad people. I just mean like, hey, we're spiritually sick. So when I put my worth and my safety into everybody else's hands, let me tell you, like, that doesn't go well. Um, and then I blame them. I don't get that, like, oh, it's me. Like, I made a decision based on self of, like, I'd rather do the quick and the easy and, like, I want to feel good and safe now instead of doing the work. So I tried to hand it off to you, and that didn't go well. And that's kind of, I think, what this last inventory that I wrote was really about. I lost my dog a couple months ago, like, like she passed away. And, uh, and my dog is, like, the best dog. I know everybody says that, but yours can't be because mine really is. <laughs> And, uh, I mean, she just rocked my world, right? I had her for almost 12 years, and she was, like, the best thing. She was so super cute, and, uh, and it's just a constant source of love, right? Like, dog God, it's literally the same thing. And it's like, every time you come home, they're so super happy to see you, and I'm super happy to see her, right? It's like, oh, hell, you know, oop. heck yeah, it's you again, you know? And it's like, that never ends. Like, you never get to be like, oh, hey, Gaia, how are you doing, buddy? It's always like, yeah, what's up? And so it's just this beautiful source of love. And I would not have willingly given that up, but she'd been struggling a lot, and it was put on my heart by God that, like, that's where we were at, you know? And so, so we kind of walked down that road. And so, like, that's been, I, I mean, I don't know. If you probably, like, if you aren't a dog person, whatever, I'm not going to justify it. I love my dog, okay? Ton of safety and security in my dog because everything in my life that would like feel bad or go wrong, I could always go home and get the juice, you know, like I could get the love and, and every, it just made everything better. And so, um, 
and so just like to have that separation right to like have that pulled out of my life has been like whoa you know and and to recognize that like more and more that I'm I'm trying to use other people to make me feel some kind of way about myself you know and it's it's actually making it worse it's making me feel terrible and I don't even know that it's like I don't think it's because that they think bad things about me it's that I think they think bad things about me and so then I base what I feel on what I think they think and it's nuts it sounds nuts doesn't it I feel nuts saying it um and the other thing is just like I don't want to say this part it's so embarrassing Oh, God. The other thing is just, like, so I turned 40 this year. Just a lot has happened, right? I turned 40. And, like, I like being pretty, okay? I'm just, I, whatever. I don't care. I'm just going to tell you the truth. It's embarrassing. Um, I like it, guys. It's quick. It's easy. It's cheap. If I feel crappy and I'm having a really crappy time, I'm just like, oh, put on a super cute outfit. And then my friends will be like, oh, my God, your shoes are so cute. And I'm like, oh, my God, thanks. Like, it's a whole thing, Okay. <laughs> And I get a lot from it. And I know that's sick, but I'm just telling you the truth, okay? And so, again, it's like one of those things, like, guys, it doesn't last. And I'm like, oh, oh, my God, like, how did I get, oh, my 40? And, and so I see this, like, being stripped away, right? And it's so painful and it's so terrifying because I've relied on it. And I don't know what's on the other side of it. And, again, like, this, I don't want to trust God in this area. If if some of these plastic surgeries that I've been looking into, if they had better reviews, which they don't, if they had better reviews, I promise you I would any day rather go get plastic surgery than have to trust God in this. And that's the truth. But thank God I don't get a choice. You know what I mean? God's like, hey, you're so attached to this. Like, I'm not going to willingly give it up, but I don't have to because it's stripped. It gets stripped from me. It gets taken away, you know? And thank God for that because I guess I don't know how else I would do it. Um... Selfishness, self-centeredness, like that literally benefits no one but me. Nobody else in my life cares. Like nobody's like, my life is better because, okay, Brad cares. Um, nobody's like, my life is better because Kate's pretty <laughs> or her outfit's cute. Nobody benefits from that but me. And yet I've spent a long time being really, really attached to it. Um, I'll try to talk about this real quick. I think I'm probably almost out of time. Okay, cool. Uh, oh, well, this is already what I was talking about. Go figure, guys. Um, this is the how and why of it. First of all, we had to quit playing God. It didn't work. And, like, that's when I quit playing is when it doesn't work, right? Because in my 20s, I'm showing up to meetings in, like, full face makeup and these super high heels and these real cute little outfits. Like, every, like, I relied on that because it worked. And now that it doesn't work, I'm looking around like, God, I don't know if you're big enough to, like, replace this, you know, which is crazy town that is cr I'm so glad I just I needed to hear how nuts of that sounded um or the dog or whatever it is you know what I mean like s trying to get my self-esteem from bad whatever all these things are that I'm putting reliance on, it's like I don't know is God big enough for that and of course like intellectually I understand that the answer is yes and I have years of experience that are like yes right like like God doing for me what I can't do for myself but I'm still not always at that place or not, maybe not even often at that place where my first instinct is to just trust God. Like my first instinct is to evaluate how can I make this work out the best for me? And I don't even realize that's what I'm doing, but that's my go-to, right? What do I need to orchestrate here so that I don't have to rely on God? So, um, I guess like, yeah, cool God, like take whatever you want because, I can't give it up on my own. So um, I guess just strip it away. And, and you know what? It'll probably be way better than, than everything I've known up to this point. So thanks. <sighs> Yay. All right. And next up, we have the notorious Cowboy Kenny. <laughs> From another state, I think Arizona, and currently in Colorado, right? Yes. Okay, I was right. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I didn't. I had no idea I was notorious. <laughs> uh, as a matter of fact, I know I'm not. Um, <clears throat> 
Yeah, I'm Ken, I'm an alcoholic. And um, my home group is in Silverton, Colorado. We meet on Wednesday nights at seven. Um, it's pretty much your choice. Silverton is the only town in the county and that's the only group we got. Um, and if we all show up, there's six of us. So if you guys show up, it helps a lot. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, we should just end. They, they've already covered it. They've, they've covered step three. And, um, and going last, all the good stuff has already been talked about. Um, and, of course, they gave me my homework assignment when I got to the table. I did not know. I was supposed to break down one page, and uh, of course I won't, because that's how I operate. But um, I'll do my best, because I'm here to be of service. Um, my sobriety date is October 5th of 1986, and I did not plan that. Um, actually, the state of uh, Arizona planned that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the third step um, there's, there's a couple things that come to my mind. Um, it's right at the end of We Agnostics. It's talking about this guy. And basically it says, isn't it that circumstances made us willing? I mean, I didn't wake up one day, even in AA, thinking, oh, I just need to be more spiritual, you know. Uh, no, it was circumstances that made me willing. It was really, somebody talked about it yesterday in step two, is we had but two alternatives, and neither one of them were good. And, um, you know, what got me to AA is, you know, I got arrested at 16, put on a one-year probation, which I would never finish until I was three years sober in Alcoholics Anonymous, because I got arrested at 17, got arrested at 18, got arrested at 19, got sent to Scared Straight Alcohol Awareness Program, um, took a good look at my drinking, and um, I didn't understand alcoholism. I mean, I had plenty of things to look at besides trouble with law enforcement. I had been in serious car wrecks. My high school girlfriend was in a wheelchair because of drunk driving. I had a plate and pins in my leg. Um, I would be getting out of jail after swearing I will never drink again at 10, getting bailed out at 10, 15, drinking. I could not stop. Um, that was the circumstances that got me somewhere. Um, I could, not, um, I could not understand that I needed more power than what I had. I, I just couldn't get that. So at 20, when I got arrested, um, I got court ordered to AA um, in Las Cruces. And, uh, you know, I was 20, 40, 40 is not old. I'm, I'm fixing to be 60. And I was 20, and those people in that room were 60, and they were old. They were old. I knew nothing about alcoholism, but they were alcoholic, and I was not. Um, so a couple years later, I don't remember really being 21 or 22, but when I got arrested right at my 23rd birthday, um, I got court-ordered back to Alcoholics Anonymous, and by the grace of God, um, I landed in a very good, solid AA home group. Knew nothing about home groups. Um, but Bill, this guy Bill, assigned himself to be my sponsor. He was five years sober. He introduced me to a, night, a guy named Bob, who was his sponsor. And I started running around with those guys because I had no other option. I was waiting for a court date. I had currently been on a zero tolerance probation. And I knew I was going to prison. And I was just going with Bob. And I did my first two third steps with those, those two guys separately. Uh, Bill was a preacher. He dressed funny. He wore plaid pants, and he hugged me, and I didn't like him. Um, and now he wanted me to get on my knees with this dude and pray with him. Um, now, I have not been through any step work. I would read him off the wall, and I concluded I did not need none of that. But... It goes back to I was out of options. I really was. I was willing to get on my knees with this guy that I didn't like, I didn't trust, and he dressed funny, and he hugged me too much. And I said, okay, um, because 
because I was out of options. Um, I knew, I knew clearly that when I put alcohol in my system, I would drink more. And I knew clearly with no alcohol in my system, I would convince myself that was my only option to feel okay on the inside. And so I did this third step prayer with this guy. And um, nothing came out of it except he's still weird and he still hugs me even more. <laughs> the next third step I did was with his sponsor, Bob. And, uh, and that was kind of the same way, but Bob had a way of making me feel comfortable. And I, what Bob did for me is he put me in his truck and he drove me around Tucson and around the state of Arizona. And um, he showed me what Alcoholics Anonymous was. Yeah, I didn't know what it was because I hadn't done any step work, but he showed me what he was doing. And he was going into jail and prison meetings. And uh, he was going to the LARC. And he was a very active member of Alcoholics Anonymous. He was a past delegate. I didn't know nothing about that. But Bob gained my trust, and I did that prayer with him. I'd never prayed with anybody before, I never, except for my dad. My dad, when I was small, and it was a weird prayer, they, he was like, when I lay me down to sleep, if I'm supposed to die tonight or something. I mean, I'm like, that's, that's not comforting. It's, it's not. Um, it ain't comforting. And I, you know, I'm going to kind of speed through my deal. I just hung around and did a bunch of service work with Bob in this home group for a few years. But I sat next to a guy named Richard. He was three, year, or three weeks sober longer than me. And some, some guy from Colorado came through and took Richard through the steps. And I watched Richard change in front of me. And, and it was important that it was Richard because I had been sitting next to Richard for a couple years, and he, he was just as sick as me. Matter of fact, more, I thought. And I saw that change in him. Um, you know, so Richard, fast story, Richard took me through the steps, and, you know, it, it got me. There's 63 pages plus the doctor's opinion that gets me up to what we're talking about today. Um, but really, it's still circumstances that made me willing to do different things. My circumstances changed. When I got here, it was all around drinking and the inability to not drink and all that stuff. And now I'm three years sober in Alcoholics Anonymous, going to a meeting basically every day, going into jail and prison meetings, going to area assemblies, being an active member of a home group, dying of untreated alcoholism because I had a spiritual malady that had not been addressed. And that's the circumstance that got me to a third step which is a scary proposition when you're driven by a hundred forms of fear and self-delusion. And, you know, I think in the, in the beginning of We Agnostics, there's a paragraph. I was just talking about this with, with Hillary a couple of days ago. It says, in the preceding chapters, we have learned something of alcoholism. We hope we have made the, clear the dis distinction between alcoholics and non-alcoholics, if when you honestly want to, you find you cannot quit entirely, or when drinking you have little control over the amount you take, you're probably alcoholic. If that be the case, you may be suffering from an illness which only a spiritual experience will, will conquer. And man, that's, that's what I was suffering from at three and a half years, uh, or three years sober. And so my third step at that point with Richard was the simple idea that I was going to take the rest of the steps. Uh, I had no concept of God. You know, I did a second step, but, but it clearly states, I got too many things that are blocking me off from God. So, you know, I can do that prayer, but it's, it basically says if, if I don't take action to get rid of the things that are blocking me off from God, it's just going to be a short-lived decision. Thank you, Brad. Um, so my third step decision was that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through the 12 steps with Richard. That, that's what it was. It was nothing more than that. Uh, the prayers were nice, but they were short-lived. And um, 
That's what we're here to talk about this whole weekend is, you know, it's uh, somebody has said a lot and it actually eventually burned into my mind that uh, the first 11 steps are about the 12th step. They're, they're not about me. They're about getting me out of me. Um, and my circumstances have changed. As I get sober, I hear, I hear these two pretty women um, talk. And before I forget, I'm sorry about your dog. Uh, anybody that knows me, uh, I love my dog. The only time my dog's not with me is when I'm, when I'm here. Um, so my circumstances change after I get sober and stay sober because I think it's Harry Tebow that talks about the rebuilding of the ego. Yeah, sign me up for that, man. Uh, I'm, I'm as willing as the dying can be, and two days later, I'm like, what the? Um, and it's, it's the rebuilding of my ego, and my circumstances change, especially as I stay sober longer, you know? Um, and the things that got me, have gotten me back to an honest third step are, are things in Alcoholics Anonymous. I mean, you know, I went through the steps with Richard. I saw a lot of stuff, but, you know, I'm 27 years old sitting in maximum security prison taking a 45-year-old through the steps. I don't have the power to do that. That, that wakes me up that I, I'm scared to death to do that. So where do I get that power? Third step decision. I'm 12 years sober, spiritual giant in Tucson, Cowboy Ken, notorious. I was notorious. Um, <laughs> until my wife, uh, you know, had an affair with the girl she's sponsoring. Where does that power come from? It comes from reminding myself, lack of power is my dilemma. I need, to, I have to find a power greater than myself for being 12 years sober. Um, 15 years sober, I had this guy, Steve, in my life, an acquaintance. He asked me, I had seen him in AA before, we did art shows together. He asked me at an art show one time, hey, Kenny, would you, would, could we talk? And I'm wrapped around my own axle, and I'm like, yeah. Yeah, let's talk, it was a Friday afternoon. I said, yeah, let's talk when we get back to Tucson. We make this little commitment for the next week. He didn't call because uh, he had shot and killed himself. Now, I don't know what would have happened if I would have said, Steve, let's finish setting up and go to dinner. Let's talk. Let's talk right now. We can finish setting up later. I don't know what would have happened because that's not what happened. What happened is I was wrapped around my own axle. I'd become more important at some point in sobriety, and, you know, and that wakes me up to I need more power than what I got. I need... I need God to take these things out of my life, these selfishnesses, and it's constant. You know, I've been sober 36, almost 37 years, uh, and I'm still wrapped around my own axle. I still have all the stuff that these two women talked about, and I should be better, shouldn't I? I mean... <laughs> I've gone to a lot of these things. I mean, <laughs> I've, I've sat through a lot of thoughts. I should be well. Um, and it always, always comes back to getting myself out of me. The first 11 steps are about the 12th step. And when I am involved in the 12th step, I'm pretty good most of the time. You know, so each day is, is a reminder of for me, each day is a reminder of just where my dependence does lie, you know. Um, thank you, Brad. Time is up, and that's exactly where time should be up. Where does my dependence lie? It relies on a power greater than myself that will solve my problems today at 36 years of sobriety, and it comes through you guys. It comes through... Come, Coming to places like this, listening to women like this, having a little conversation in the hall, 
um, those things feed my soul and they get me out of myself. At least till I get into Estes Park <laughs> where all that traffic is. I mean, I go sideways then, but, but I, get, I, get the, I get the couple hours here of serenity and it, it'll get me to another thoughts probably. Um, I just want to end with just this, um, just the thought of all the people that have come ahead of me and alongside of me that aren't here today. Um, that doesn't mean they're passed away. just means they're not here today. And uh, I love them the same as, way, as I love all you guys. Thanks. You're okay. You did good. All right. Uh, I hope that, uh, first of all, let's thank the panelists again because they were fantastic. I hope if you're new here or if you're old here and you've been disturbed by something they've said and it's cracked open in you, something that you thought was neatly hidden away, uh, thank God there are nine more steps, right? Um, so uh, we have about six minutes left. If anybody would share about, like to share about their third step. Short first. You can go second, Jeff. Hi, hi everyone. My name is Tony Blankenship. I'm a recovered alcoholic. Tony. I'm also very concerned with being pretty. <laughs> I know. Uh, thank you. So, um, last year I spoke at the first step panel about unmanageability, and <clears throat> I, uh, two weeks ago, I don't know, maybe it was a week ago. I had uh, spent the last year uh, repeatedly uh, going against my own values and uh, breaking my own heart over and over. And uh, I ended up on my knees, which I don't typically do. And uh, I said this thing, God, I give you everything. I have no idea what I'm supposed to do, where I'm supposed to go. Please take away all my desires, all my ambitions, all my motivations, all my, like, I have no idea what to do. And what I really, really want, more than anything in this world, is a more intimate and deeper relationship with you. I have no idea how to get it. And... um I um, and I don't feel any better, <laughs> and because uh, that whole thing of, are you convinced that any life run on self will can hardly be a success? Usually, you have to have been living your life based on self will to be convinced, and I hadn't been convinced, and uh, I'm convinced. Thanks. <laughs> I'm Jeff Gould. I'm an alcoholic, and that was a hell of a powerful panel. I, uh, man, I, uh, you know, there's a line in the third step. It didn't mean much to me till about 16 years. I actually think it explains every failure and every success in Alcoholics Anonymous we've ever heard. And it says when we sincerely took a position, because I can show you instructions and you can take them. And I, I did my step homework. This ain't about that, guys. This is about walking out to the edge of the Grand Canyon backwards. I'm going to put a blindfold on me, and I'm going to put a blindfold on you, and we're going to hold hands, and what happens next? We're going to all fall off backwards. And then what? What's going to happen to us? I don't know either. <laughs> but we can't stay here. So I give you, I, we can beg, borrow, and steal anything we like. If you're like me and you're 15, 10, 20, I'm 20, and you've taken you know, a lot of people through the work. I was taking a 19-year-old guy. He was getting ready to go to West Virginia Tech. 
and we're going to take a third step prayer before he left. And you probably had this experience too. So we get on our knees. You ready? I'm ready. And it sounds something like this. And um, God is strong enough to work with the flimsiest of prayers if you back it up with work and intention. But I thought, man, that was just, I, I was reflecting on it for days. That was the most unceremonious thing I've ever expected. Because it says, what do we do and what does this mean? This should mean something. This is your life, dude. And so I, I offer, I don't expect, but I offer, this isn't my third step. This is yours. If, if you have your grandfather's watch from World War II, you bring that. If it's sage, if it's sweetgrass, if it's Bible verse, if it's music lyrics. Because I'm trying to raise your intention from, from here to here. Come at this thing swinging, dude. This is your life. So you, you take and reflect. What do you want the prayer to be? What do you want to bring to this process? And I'll meet you there halfway. And then we're holding hands and back over the cliff we go. You know what I mean? Because that's what we're doing here. Thanks for letting me share. We have one minute. Good. My name is Mike Hall. I'm alcoholic. Uh, my sobriety dates uh, June 15th, 1993, and I was struck sober. I had a white light experience the first weekend of September of 1993, and that's why I'm sober today. Uh, the third step prayer is a covenant, is a contract I made with my, this power. And I only did it once. Uh, a lot of people think he... This is my experience. My experience is I got to do it one time, and it meant something. And as a result of that, uh, I've been living a pretty good life lately. And uh, not that it's all, you know, all the time, but it's good. And I appreciate the opportunity to speak here at FOTS. It's a second-step program. Third step's the contract. That's all I got, thanks. Thank you. Flip the page over. All right. Oh, I keep forgetting to read this. We're supposed to read this. Uh, the AA Al Anon anonymity statement. Sorry, Brad. Brad told me this, and I keep making mistakes. Um, there may be those present who are not familiar with the AAs and Al-Anon's tradition of anonymity, uh, so I will read the anonymity statement. Our anonymity, like our sobriety, is a treasured possession. We ask the help of our guests, especially those representing the press or broadcasting media, in protecting the anonymity of all alcoholics and Al-Anon's present or mentioned today. Our public relations policy is based on attraction rather than promotion. We need always maintain personal anonymity at the level of press, radio, TV, and films. Thus, we respectfully ask that no AA or Al-Anon speaker, or indeed any AA or Al-Anon member, be identified by full name or photograph in published or broadcast reports of our meetings. The assurance of anonymity is essential in our effort to help other problem drinkers who may wish to share our recovery program with us. And our tradition of anonymity reminds us that AA and Al-Anon principles come before personalities. We hope when you hear something at this meeting, uh, which you can take away and use, or that you heard something, apparently I was supposed to read it first. Uh, we respectfully request, however, that you eliminate any mention of names in reference to members of Alcoholics Anonymous or Alana. Okay. Um, please remember to clean up the wreckage of your presence and pick up any trash as you exit. By group conscience, the Fellowship of the Spirit does not close each meeting with the Lord's Prayer. Instead, we encourage that this whole conference be treated with an attitude of continuous prayer. And we will then say the Lord's Prayer together at the close of this conference on Sunday. Please stand and help me close this meeting with a moment of silence. Let us share our spiritual experience and the strengths with each other so that we can grow together in greater understanding and love.
Thank you. And please join us in 12 minutes for the fourth and fifth step panel.